<clears throat> for information view that this, this seminar is sponsored by the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, USF, as well as Carter Center for Urban Transition Research in USF, and facilitated by uh, the IETE student chapter. So uh, my name is Yu Yu Zhang. I'm a professor from uh, CE department, as well as serve as program director at Carter for the Advanced Game Activities. So today we're very glad to have uh, a guest from a long way, um, and a doctor, uh, Claudio Gabriello da Cuma. And he's a full professor of the Department of Transition Engineering within the Polytech School at the University of Sao Paulo, USP in Brazil. Um, Dr. Kuhan served as the department head and the deputy head before for that department. Um, he just concluded his term as a Fulbright Distinguished Chair Visiting Faculty in CE Department at University of California, uh, uh, University of California, Davis. And um, Dr. Kuhan's research uh, span the urban and the sustainable translation and logistics with a focus on applying mathematical models and developing algorithms to address real world problems. So he has roughly 40 years of experience already in the field of transition planning and logistics. So I also want to thank Such King to bring us this distinguished guest to us, and we really look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here with you. Today, I'm talking about some real world applications of optimization and data analytics in transportation and logistics. I think that I can skip this slide because I have been already properly introduced. And basically, this is an outline of my presentation. So, I'm going to start by giving you some introduction to OR and its importance in transportation logistics. And then I will jump into some different problems that I have been, that I worked recently. One related parcel lockers, when they can help mitigate externalities in last mile e-commerce in urban areas. Uh, also optimization applied to ambulance dispatch system in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and also, um, um, research related on how to measure and compare different urban areas in terms of their difficulty to deliver products. Last mile distribution. Okay. And finally, some concluding remarks. So I'm going to start by calling our attention for the fact that transportation has evolved significantly in the last 100, 120 years. In the end of 19th century, you know, the major concern in big cities was that every city, every road would be covered with many. Nowadays, technology has transformed the transportation and logistics sectors. We have seen a lot of companies that rely on technology to provide services, products, and these are companies that did not exist maybe 20 years ago. Some of them you are familiarized with, some of them you may not. Mercado Libre is a company that is very strong in Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina. It competes and it works. It's really um, performs better than Amazon in those countries. So it's very large. You see Chinese companies and etc. Basically, transportation and logistics comprise different problems complex problems, routing and scheduling of vehicles and crews, location and network design problems, crew scheduling problems in general, and I could name maybe a hundred different problems, different challenges. Basically, uh, what I've been doing, I've been applying operations research to real world problems in logistics and transportation. Why real world problems? Because I come from a public university in my country, it's state funded, and more and more our authorities and even our citizens, they are concerned that we are doing research 
especially in engineering, that we try to solve real world problems. So we try to solve and address real world problems. Okay, so I like uh, uh, some definition of OR as a decision science that employs mathematical models. Okay, sometimes when I say mathematical models, for instance, business school, I sometimes give some anti asset for students because sometimes students say, oh, mathematics, I don't like it. But mathematics is something really fancy and fantastic. I like the way MIT defines operations research as an MIT approach to decision making. So we are talking about decision making. OK, and I must tell you, this is some passion for me. I like doing OR, applying OR to solve real world problems. Uh, this is something that you probably find if you uh, look for online. In the past, INFORMS, which is a, an association related to operations research and analytics, would brand OR as the science of better. How executives, time standard, are making bolder decisions with less risk, better outcomes, their secret OR. You still can find some of those ads to convince people that OR is a very valuable tool. Any questions so far? If you want to interrupt me, you can ask any question. It will be very good. So why OR to solve complex real world combinatorial problems? For those who are not familiarized with the uh, combinatorial problems, let's consider the famous, well-studied traveling salesman problem in which given a set of cities, you have to find the shortest path visiting each city exactly once. Okay, so this is one possible solution for that. And you wanted to minimize the total distance traveled. If you consider a problem with four cities, you have just six different possibilities of visiting these cities. If you consider a problem a little bit bigger, seven cities, you have to 720 different alternatives. If you consider 27 cities, the number of combinations is humongous. It becomes very difficult. No spreadsheet will have enough rows and columns for you to just enumerate all the possibilities. OK, and I like to present not only scientific notation, but also like this, because not always I have an audience that can fully understand how big this number is. So sometimes I just write it down so that people can have a um, uh, an idea of how hard it is to solve this problem. And if we would consider one that was one of the fastest computers until recently, okay, it would require to enumerate all combinations. I'm not talking about parallel computing, uh, cloud computing, etc. Just a computer very powerful. It would take 186,000 days which means 511 years to enumerate all combinations. Okay, you're gonna say this problem has no practical application in transportation, but a problem that is derived from this problem is a very real world problem. Every company now has issues, uh, has to address on a daily basis routing uh, aspects. So let's consider that you have 500 deliveries to be made. It can be B2B, it can be B2C. You're familiarized with B2B and B2C? Yes, okay. It doesn't matter. I think that B2C, it's easier because you can just drop the package to the, you know, to the door of someone's home and you can go to the next stop. But if you are doing B2B for business, in some developing countries like Brazil, sometimes you get to the store and then you say, can you wait for 10 minutes, please? Can you come later? Because I'm quite busy, I can't handle this now. So they have to change the route, they have to do it a very efficient way, otherwise they will not be able to complete the route in time. It happens, oftentimes happens, okay? So 500 deliveries, 25 vehicles, and two hours to complete that. You have just received the orders you have to deliver for tomorrow, and you have to decide how to 
assign those deliveries into those 25 vehicles. Again, you have to do to provide something like this routes, which means which deliveries are should be loaded into each vehicle and also their sequence. Again, this is the number of combinations. So we are talking about very hard problems. Okay. I don't know if you are familiarized with this Franz Edelman Award. This is an uh, award that's uh, uh, sponsored and organized by the INFORBS, this Institute for Operations Research and Management Science. It's a kind of global award, Oscar award in OR. And the award is not because of the beauty of the model. It is related real achievements. And basically, real achievements means savings, <clears throat> benefits from companies. So the winners, the finalists are selected based on how companies could improve their operations. Okay. And they have made some calculations that said that the benefits exceed $400 billion since this price started in the early 70s. So it's a lot of results. And guess what? A lot of applications, several applications in transportation and logistics. For instance, Walmart, it was the winner of last year's, the last uh, prize, Walmart optimizing their strategy and execution in terms of network design, how to transform the network, and how to do the routing and planning, and load planning, and how to simulate it in order to take into consideration uncertainty. Or you consider one of the finalists of last year, GHL, Transport Network Optimizer, in which they would optimize freight, fleet, trips, and pool point. You see, in order to reduce miles, in order to maximize utilization, in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is a major concern nowadays, you know, environmental aspects. I don't know, I've not been in Florida for a long time recently, uh, but in, back in my country, Brazil, we are in the South Hemisphere, so it's summertime, so every day we have a major storm. We have flooding threat and storms have become more intense in the last 20 years. I lived in Gainesville 20 years ago. I was on a sabbatical at the University of Florida, Industrial Systems Engineer Department. I remember it rained every afternoon during summer. It was kind of 10 minutes rain, 15 minutes rain. It doesn't affect anyone. We just waited and there will be no flooding. Nowadays, I'm not sure what happens in Florida, but in Brazil, Sometimes you have to plan. I see dark uh, clouds in the sky. I say, either I go home now before it rains, or I have to wait two hours after it stopped raining because it got, it got flooded. So greenhouse gas emissions is something very important. Transition to electric vehicles in freight is also very important and has a lot of different applications of optimization. How many charging stations? Where? Queues. <laughs> when to charge? Full charge or partial charge, etc. A lot of different problems. Okay. Um, again, some years ago, let's say uh, eight years ago, the winner was UPS with a system that developed, uh, you know, uh, for them to improve their solutions in terms of routing of the vehicles. It took them eight to 10 years to complete the system. And they could obtain better, significant improvements in terms of distance travel, number of required vehicles, and et cetera. Okay? Uh, as you can see, some of the benefits. And uh, uh, it uh, uh, optimized like 30,000 routes every day. So very impressive. OK, and to summarize, I could be going. I have another presentation in which I go into all of this 
I just skipped some of them. So winners of the Springs Edelman Award that are related to transplantation in the recent years and finalists. So you can see that we have a lot of opportunities. Every year on this award, you have at least one of the finalists is a company that's working in some problem related to transportation and logistics. United Nations World Food Program here, Intel, UPS, as you can see, a lot of them. So a lot of opportunities. So now let's move some, to some of the research I've been developing. In places like Brazil, we do not attract as many PhD students full-time as we wish. People don't see many value in, the, in you know, pursuing a PhD degree. They sometimes think a master would be good. So I would say that I advise, let's say five master students for each PhD. I have advised something between 40 and 45 master's students in the last 20 to 22 years and only a dozen of PhD students. So most of the work that I do, I do with master's students. OK, this is a uh, uh, work with a former master's student who now runs a company who does network optimization. OK, companies that want to decide what would be the best location for their facilities, and et cetera. So they do this type of analysis of uh, optimizing the network design. So they, they have work on this. And we will analyze what are the role of pickup point parcel lockers to mitigate the problems in urban distribution. Basically, we are talking about home deliveries, places like big cities in Brazil, and sometimes even in Europe, in which packages may not be left unattended by their doors, by their ports, because they're going to be taken by someone. Even in Davis, I was on a, on a group, and the, some of the neighbors were saying, no, no, there is someone following the UPS or the Amazon truck, and when you see a big package, this package will just disappear from your porch if you do not receive it, something that may be a video game or something that's expensive or fancy. So sometimes you cannot do that. In Europe, residential and office buildings do not receive packages at their lines. So um, the idea, and also it's important, this is something that was headlines for New York Times before the pandemics. So 1.5 million packages a day in New York area. Chaos to New York Street, gridlock, go safely. You know one, you know one, what is one of the most valuable assets in the urban environment nowadays? One of the most demanding areas of the urban space nowadays. Curb. Because everyone wants to be by the curb. You have package delivery, and uh, with Amazon two hour delivery, you, you, I want to eat some chocolate, some candy. So I'm going to order, and it will be delivered to me here by the end of this presentation, two hour delivery. Also, you have Uber, Lyft, and etc. Nova drives. You have bicycles, you have bus stops. So if you go to the to TRB conference, Transportation Research Board conference, everyone's discussing how to manage curbside in order to mitigate those conflicts. So basically what uh, we see in New York, okay, New York was one of the most traffic congested city, two million parcels. Imagine nearly 8,000 vehicles every day. 60,000 vehicle hours traveled every day and curbside congestion. Basically, how to mitigate those externalities. What we have seen in Brazil and now in other cities is that we are, some cities are discussing if they should regulate it and charge vehicles for every stop they make in urban downtown area, which is very congested. 
So basically, one possibility to mitigate both the supply side in terms of curbside congestion, as well as the difficulty to deliver to our door. In my place in Brazil, I never have anything delivered to my door because it may never get there. It may be taken. So I always look for something like a locker, like a pickup point, which means that someone is handling even this to be, it's very common in Europe, France, Germany, and etc. Or you have an also a poodle. What's the difference between a parcel lock and a poodle? Have an idea? In a poodle, you can return the product. In a parcel lock, you can just retrieve what you are in line. And the other one, you are able, if you are returning something, you can just get, drop it there. Okay. You probably read something in the news that Amazon is going to charge if you are returning products and you are not returning to the Amazon lockers or to some facilities. If you are returning, for instance, to UPS, you are going to be charging $1, $2 for the return of the products because it's difficult to manage. So basically, the research question that it has, in what circumstances can pickup points or parcel lockers be more efficient than home delivery for large cities? I'm talking about just small packages, things that you can carry. You don't need a huge effort to be carried. Um, we, are, we are looking for operational and environmental points of view. And basically, the key question was, what would be the delivery density that would justify utilizing these facilities? Because if the delivery density is uh, measured as the number of stops per unit area, square mile or square kilometer or something, maybe you are just replacing one home delivery by one delivery to a pickup point. So that would be, what would be the trigger? And how these results are influenced by the line of distance, the distance between the delivery station to the area where you're delivering. Okay, if you're located far or close to that area. Basically, the approach we proposed was something that uh, uses optimization to investigate. Uh, instead of analytical models, if you go into the literature, there are a lot of analytical models uh, like, you know, the Gunso style models in which you would uh, try to uh, have an estimate of the route length and etc. We are trying, we are applying optimization model. Okay. And uh, how does the demand that is destined to pick up points to parcel lockers would affect distance travel and fleet? Basically, first question how many pick up points? are needed in a given area, depending on the maximum walking distance. We were considered different walking distances. As well, what would be the reductions in terms of vehicles, uh, miles traveled, and delivery costs? And what would be the environmental benefits? Okay, uh, basically we are considering different density of points based on real data from one major uh, um, e-commerce player in Brazil. So you can see all those blue dots are delivery locations. We are doing some sort of randomization here. So they are not exactly the same locations every day. And also we are considering these different line haul distances, which means from where the vehicle, the vehicle departs to the area where it's delivering. 40 miles would be something like 25, um, 26, uh, uh, four kilometers will be 25, 26 miles. This is going to be 10 miles. This is going to be very close to the area. Okay. Uh, we applied an integer programming model to determine the optimal number of location and location for those lockers and pickups. We selected all establishments, gas stations, small marts, every place where you could place one of those lockers here as candidates, and we are trying to minimize the number of them. And we were applying routine models, 
these are a routine model in which vehicles would be delivering to the homes, and this would be if they would be delivering to pick up points part of the deliveries. You can see visually that there is a significant reduction in terms of miles and in terms of vehicles required. Basically, uh, you can see that the reductions in terms of emissions can be significant, and you can see reductions in vehicle miles depending on the demand and also depending of the amount of demand. Sorry, this is the amount of the density of deliveries, different densities, and this is the uh, percentage of deliveries that are directed to pickup points. In this case, 20%, 40%, 6%, 80%. So different uh, uh, um, percentages of deliveries that are directed to pickup points. As you can see, we can reduce vehicle miles in almost 60%, which means less emission, less congestion. Okay. And uh, I can share this presentation, but we have a paper that describes this uh, uh, algorithm. So you assume that, that if you put the locker system, then the customers will walk to the lock system. Yes. So likely they're going to drive to the locker to get their passes. This is something that we did not consider. We were assuming that, that they would be walking, not driving. Is that common in Brazil? I would say walk? even the difficulty in central areas for parking, uh -huh. uh, we would assume that people would be willing to walk some blocks, like four blocks from each direction to pick up their parcels, given the difficulty. I think that a possible extension of this work would be how people would be driving to the parcel lockers and what would be that impact in terms of vehicle miles, but we should also consider not only impacts in terms of vehicles miles, but the impact in temporal times as well, because maybe people would be heading to those places when they are returning home, so maybe the detour may not be that big in which people would find a parcel lock on their way home. Uh, you know, researchers Professor Andrew Child from University of Washington in Seattle, they are doing some work related work on this topic that I'm familiar with. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so, did you uh, use the already available lockers in the city or in the city? We don't have uh, many lockers available in the city. So, we are trying to understand. Uh, how many would be needed, you know, uh, in order to, if some company would like to, to implement something like that, they would need an idea of the total investments, especially if it's some sort of automated locker system. Hold up, question. Are the capacity of the lockers are same? Did you assume they are the same? Uh, yes, and an interesting extension of this work for future work would be to consider how big those lockers should be, depending on how many days for how long you would leave the package in that locker. What happens if for Amazon oftentimes is that you are scheduled to have the deliver on a certain day, and they usually deliver one day before, sometimes, especially to lockers two days before. When I travel to the US, I come from Brazil for a short time. Hotels, they don't like to receive packages. So if I want to order something from Amazon, I have to rely on a friend, like my dear friend Seth can say, would you mind if I had something dropped to your home and you have to have my package and bring it to me or something? Never asked this from him so far. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's inconvenient because sometimes it arrives two days in advance and I have not arrived in the city and it's going to stay for only three days. I have just one day to repeat it. Another uncertainty is how soon the customer will go. Yes, to get absolutely. Hustle, right? absolutely. Maybe they have a business trip and several yes. days. Yes, 
like me. I'm a business <laughs> trip, you know. If I order something for my hotel here in Tampa area, I arrive the, on Wednesday. If the package was delivered on Monday, and I was leaving, and maybe I would not have enough time to retrieve it before leaving the, the city. Or the package would be uh, uh, would be removed from the locker. Yes. Okay. Super. Yeah. Uh, like accessibility issues, because a lot of people rely on door to door service because they don't have the ability to go to locker and insert code. That's, That's another door. interesting uh, point. Very good question. We did not take this into consideration. We would consider uh as a possible extension how uh, if people if they can walk we could consider you know if the area is is not mountainous or something like that if the people have access to car if they could drive or not if they have access to public transport and etc very good questions very interesting i would be i'd love to work on these topics if there's someone that's interested we could collaborate i could uh uh, you know, share those tools and we could do uh, additional analysis. Okay. May I jump to the next? <laughs> okay. The next one is the one that was related to our emergency medical service in Brazil. I don't know if you are, if you are familiarized, but we have in Brazil a um, universal healthcare system. For instance, if any of you is traveling to Brazil and you suffer an accident, regardless of health insurance, depending on the severity of our accident, they are going to call an ambulance, you're going to be taken to a hospital free of charge. If you have health insurance, this hospital will probably give you your health insurance company. Otherwise, you're going to be treated. So we have a very uh, 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 universal. So, it's different from, from here. I was in Davis one day, I was biking because Davis, everybody bikes, no one drives. I was biking to campus. And one day on the bike lane by a nice place called Arboreto, there I found a cyclist falling on the floor. He was there, his bike was there, and he was hurting and he couldn't move. So I, I was the first to get there. And I said, should I call ambulance? He said, no, please, let me see if I can get up because it's going to cost me a lot. My parents are going to be mad and et cetera. This is something completely different from our reality. You know? <laughs> if you have a, if, if you can walk, if you just, you know, uh, something with your foot or something, you're going to call, probably call an ambulance. You will not be refraining from doing this. Okay. What happened in, in Sao Paulo area? Uh, we have a service that's provided by the city of Sao Paulo. Uh, this is, these numbers are quite a bit old. It traces back to 10 years ago. So this service would receive 9,000 calls per day. They have 140 ambulances that are located on 77 different locations. Okay, serve areas that are very distinct in terms of population density, land use, road infrastructure, traffic congestion. And basically, they have like uh, 1,200 dispatches every day, which is quite big. And, you know, the calls, they, they change over days and uh, uh, times. There are some business areas in which you have a lot of calls during the day. These areas are very many few calls during the night, and etc. And in 2007, <clears throat> response time was about 30 minutes. To be more precise, within 27 minutes for 98% of all calls, which was not added, which was poor service. So the question was how to improve service. The easy answer for that, adding more ambulances. So just buy more ambulances is gonna solve the problem. But how many? Where to locate them? On different periods of the day, okay? Also, do you need new stations for those ambulances, place where they stay when they are not being in service? How many, where? 
and also we have difficulty for the public service to open new stations. It requires time because a lot of bureaucracy don't have suitable buildings. Um, new construction takes time, it's very expensive. Sometimes uh, it's costly to do some sort of renovation and also real estate costs. So the uh, chief in office of the service, he wanted to evaluate the possibility of operating on some sort of movable stations. So stations like those trailer parks or something that uh, would allow this to be installed in squares and parks, etc. This is just an example of movable stations. You're going to say, oh, people don't want to be there. Of course, they don't want to be there. But suppose that they're going to stay here for a few minutes before calls, half an hour. They won't be staying the whole day. So would, be, would that be an effective solution? to overcome the difficulty to expand the number of stations or to relocate those that had become poorly located. And as I said, they can be put in any public spaces and easily relocated to improve coverage. Okay, basically we applied an algorithm. The problem is too complex to be solved to manage at that time. Nowadays, maybe we have uh, you know, software and computers that could work. And we decided to use an um, artificial bee colony algorithm also because it was easy for our, you know, the one that was hiring us to explain, to say the problem is too complex. We are going to mimic how bees are efficient and we're going to solve this problem. So I'm going to go into the details of the uh, artificial decoding algorithm. But basically, we were applying this. We we're analyzing scenarios in which we were keeping the original locations versus what we call refuel. So get rid of all the stations and let's see what be the ideal locations if we start from scratch. Also, with the response times ranging from five to 15 minutes, what be the impacts? And also call durations of two, three, or four hours. I'm going to see how does it take four hours for a call? Because in Brazil, when the ambulances rescue someone on the road and they get to the hospital and everybody's busy on the hospital, it's the responsibility of the ambulance team to take care of the patient until the hospital can receive the patient. So there are times in which an ambulance and a team may stay for several hours with the patient, giving him, if it's not something life-threatening, if the patient may be with that ambulance team for several hours before they can release the patient, they can, uh, the patient can be admitted to the hospital. So sometimes you have calls that take two to four hours, and it's not because in few uh, the accident scene that will take all the action. And we analyzed combinations, location of bases, number of ambulances required, vehicle repositioning. We did a, um, an analysis for a full week, seven days, three periods of time, morning, afternoon, and night, evening, night. And we analyzed for 21 periods. Basically, what we have achieved, and it has been implemented, we could reduce response times from 27 to 10 minutes. It was really impressive. We could determine the best locations for ambulances and stations. And also, we had you know, in one of our major newspapers in Brazil, a nationwide newspaper, it's like the US New and World Report, but not everybody reads it, but it's kind of New York Times or Washington Post or everything. Uh, my Herald, I don't know if I'm saying the right names, but we could say that the headline would be Bees Inspired Changes in Our Ambulance Service. Natural Collective Intelligence of Insects served as basis for a study developed by the University of Sao Paulo that helped speed up the service in Sao Paulo. Okay, and we they could also publish the reduction response time from something that could be up to 45 minutes to 10 minutes. 
also this work won the prize, uh, 2014 prize, i 4 zoar prize for noir in development. So best application in developing countries related to OR. So 10 years ago, I was in July 2014 in Barcelona, very nice place in July, and we were competing with other works, very good works, and we could be the winners of this work. Okay? For this, there's something like we have the Florida Road Rangers, and you're familiar with them because you've yes. been in terms of Florida. So uh, I believe actually uh, Dr. Wei Sang Lin here at Cutter, he did work on some like an optimization algorithm to to locate, you know, which location is how many, what's going to be the response rate, and all that. So I think you know where eventually I can connect to the board of you, but that may be a very interesting uh, yes. application. So very similar type of uh, yes. a topic. I would love to. Thank you very much. A clarification question. So for that station, is only one evidence field? No. We would it would uh, it would uh, uh, hold for more than one ambulance. We would decide how many ambulances and uh, how the ambulances would be relocated in each period of eight hours. So you do rebalance them. We do rebalance dynamically. Yes, uh, dynamically in the sense we are considering those eight hours period, which was deemed as uh, appropriate for their planning stage. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, so, and ambulances start from one station and end up in others. Yes, they can. Yes, they can start from one and end in another station. Yes, so that's possible depending on where they they are assigned for uh, you know to do some sort of rescue. They could end up. So capacity was not a problem for those stations. Okay, so we could handle. We'll see, we would not see more than five ambulances at a time because we have 77 stations, you know, and 150 ambulances. So in general, something between two and four or five ambulances. So you have formed this and it's different from general VRP, right? Yes. And this is not exactly our VRP because you have to dispatch an ambulance to a location and from there, he probably the patient has to go to the hospital. And from there, if there is not another call, the ambulance will return to the station. Otherwise, they're going to be sent to the, the next incident that requires an ambulance. And we also had two types of ambulance. One more, you know, with less resources and some ambulances that are equipped with some life supporting system that would uh, allow severe patients, uh, hurt patients to be, you know, to have support to reach the hospital. But that's not a decision variable. No. It's given in your property. The, the number of ambulances? Right. No, we are trying to understand. We had in each station um, a number of ambulances that would be more than enough and we would we see how many ambulances were really required to be dispatched from the stage. So it, it's not a decision where in the sense that uh, uh, they were there. We are not calculating this number, but based on the number of ambulances that were dispatched from each station, we had an idea how many ambulances were required in each station in a period of time. Because I asked the question because at the beginning you mentioned that, you know there are already a fleet of ambulance. Yes. But the dispatching time at the time, response time is too high. So one possibility is still you need to find like, one ambulance yes. even after. So the idea was to identify if uh, new ambulances were needed, if we had to add more ambulances or that fleet would be enough. That's mm -hmm. one of the answers we were receiving. So eventually what you did was keep the same number of ambulance. Yes. You can, with optimization, you can yes. use that. Yes. Okay. The other one would be let's uh, uh, make the number of ambulances as large as the, you know, it's not constrained. And in order to identify if what would be the improvements if new ambulances were, were added to the system. Yes, any one would be cost involved, but they wanted to just to understand uh, how to best, you know, allocate their resources. Okay, 
And my final uh, presentation, another, uh, once again, with um, a master's student, she now has finished her PhD here at RPI with Professor Jose Veras. So she did a master under my supervision and she came to the US. You probably know her. She's in Edward now. Yes, Edward now, exactly. She got the job as a postdoc there. And we were trying to evaluate how urban street networks affect last mile distribution. Okay, uh, this is a work that started from an idea that we had together with our colleagues from MIT, Center for Transportation Logistics. At the time we started developing this idea, the person that was at MIT was Edgar Blanco, Dr. Edgar Blanco, who now works for Walmart after spending some time um, in Amazon. This work has another interesting work that was developed uh, uh, um, by Dr. Daniel Mersha, who now works for Amazon Last Mile Distribution in Texas, Austin. We, we took different paths, but the works are related. Basically, how to characterize and compare urban areas in terms of their complexity and difficulty for last mile operations. We are now focusing here on B2B operation, not B2C. Okay, not delivering packages to doors, to home doors. We are delivering products to stores, supermarkets, and etc. And how to compare areas and cities in an easy and straightforward manner, take into consideration the road network, travel speeds, landscape, if the mountainous area or not. Basically, the key idea here is what we call the circuit factor. What is a secret factor? Secret factors it is the difference between the on the fly, the clean distance and the real distance that vehicle has to perform. Why is that? Because if you are delivering to point I and then J, and for some reason, at point I, the guy says, Could you come back half an hour later? Because everybody's late, it's busy now. You're delivering to a food restaurant and it's noon time and the rest everybody's working they're not able to handle the you know the load at the time they say could you, could you come back later so you skip delivery to i come to j and you have to return in this case and this is true the return would require an additional distance because some roads are one way you know right turns left turns are not allowed you are probably familiarized with the fact that, except in the US, left turns are very uncommon. If you go to Europe, you not find opportunities to do left turns, crossing, you know, the other lanes that come that are coming in the opposite direction. It's very uncommon that. Um, UPS system that I mentioned before, one of the reasons of the routing software be so, so successful is that it would avoid left turns. It would uh, design the routes in which they would uh, favor right turns. Okay, so that's the idea. So instead of this distance between these two points, you would have to, to do the blue lines a longer distance. This is something between two points that are not far away in the city of Sao Paulo. You have the origin and the, the, the destination. If you are walking, okay, you just cross the very short distance. If you are biking in places in the country in Brazil, okay, you're gonna go do that. You're gonna cross and do the red one. But if you are driving, <laughs> you're going to have to take a huge detour. So those two points can be close or distant or apart from each other, depending on the mode of transportation that you're using. If you're using cargo bikes, it's going to be OK. If you're walking, it's going to be OK. If you're using motorcycles, it's going to be OK. But you're driving, it can be a nightmare. So how to compare different cities? 
So we were analyzing some different cities, two in Brazil, Sao Paulo and Rio, the biggest cities in Brazil, Bogotá in Colombia, because Bogotá has a, uh, the mountains and the downtown area is very flat, but you have mountains, New York, London and San Francisco areas, okay? So we were calculate circuit factors for different distance between stops. So if you are doing stops that are very frequent, so the distance between two consecutive stops would be like half kilometer, half kilometer, uh, uh, would uh, would be like uh, 0.3 miles or something like that. Okay, you're gonna see that the box plots for the uh, circuit factors are high. They tend to decrease as consecutive stops are more apart from each other because it is not that affected by the local rights and left turns that are allowed or not traffic lights and etc and basically as you can see maybe the secret factors are high in sao paulo higher in rio because rio is a very mountainous city a lot of natural barriers they are not San Francisco is the best city for very short, and New York stands in the middle of the way. But this is okay. This is good. This is good for us engineers or people with technical skills to understand those box plots, etc. But what like if I show you like this? These are the different cities, and green means low circuit factors. Red means. Uh, high circuit factors. So as you can see, it's very easy to navigate in San Francisco because in general, you, you are allowed to do left to turns everywhere. You have a lot of one-way streets, but in general, you know, you have a sort of Manhattan grid like in New York. So it's not that difficult, but you can see in real, in some areas very complex. In Sao Paulo, from you to cross from this place to the other place, maybe you have to have a huge detour. That would give an idea to companies where they should pay more attention in their routes, in the sense that the, where they would have to be very careful with their sequences, because if you do, they are not able to follow the sequence you are going to be in trouble because you are going to increase total distance travel because you have to return. You are going to make a stop here. You have to return to that point again. So the detour will be high. Okay. We were also investigating in another work that's not related exactly to this one. What would be the reasons why drivers would not follow the schedule rules? Because sometimes you have something that says give you a sequence of stops and you can see that, uh, you know, uh, drivers do not follow. They decide to do from their mind. So they decide to change the order. We are trying to investigate if there was some relation with the secret factors in which they have something on their minds that would make them select a different route. By the way, Amazon, together with MIT, Center for Transportation and Logistics, two years ago, they launched a competition in which they give data from routes or delivery packages. And they were trying, they were, you know, the first prize was $150,000 for those who could come up with an algorithm that would provide good routes for them. Okay, so this is a major concern for players on this topic. Travel speeds, as you can see, travel speeds, again, green is good, red is bad. Sao Paulo on different times, different uh, is kind of snapshots on different times. 1 a.m., so probably no traffic congestion. You can see a lot of greens in which you will be traveling above, in average, above 50 miles per hour. Very few reds. You can see a lot of yellows, 
that would be between 8 and 15 miles per hour on average in Sao Paulo. If you go to New York, you're going to see that New York is much more congested. You see a lot of rents instead of very low speeds for deliveries. Uh, and even at, you know, middle of the night, or midnight, 1 a.m., you're going to see that you cannot drive very fast because there are a lot of traffic lights, in speed enforcement, and etc. Okay, but 1 p.m., and 6 p.m. are sort of a nightmare for places like this. And we also did some sort of analysis, visual analysis of steepness of the roads. Why is that? Because we understand how difficult it would be to use cargo bikes. <laughs> so in Sao Paulo, you'd see that you have a lot of, you know, places here that's kind of, San Francisco, not as you know, steep as San Francisco, not Lombard Street. We don't have any Lombard Street on there, but we have some areas in which would not be very proper if you would consider, uh, you know, cargo bikes that you don't have any assistance for the biker. Okay. And New York and London, they don't have much problem on this aspect. So basically, this was another article that was published in Journal Cities that tries to, to understand a little bit and provide some visual information for last mile delivery. This work was also inspired on the works of a professor from University of Southern California, Geoff Boyne. He's doing a lot of analytics using uh, street networks, different measures to compare street networks. I think, oh, and to conclude, some other ideas. We've been working with my students on how to, you know, solve this auto carrier loading and transportation problem in Brazil. With that, we have different rules uh, from other countries. We are allowed to remove all those vehicles, if the best spot for this vehicle is here, in some places in Europe, you cannot, you know, you cannot reload a vehicle. So first stop, you're going to have to remove this vehicle from here. Second stop, though, so you're not able to reload. In Brazil, we are able to reload. So we have two different papers that have been published in good journals as well. Uh, we have also addressed a problem in which we had to optimize the production and the distribution of two major newspapers in Sao Paulo. I know that nobody reads printed newspapers nowadays, but five, six years ago, we had like 150,000 deliveries in Sao Paulo. So those two major newspapers they would compete for information, but they were visiting the same places. So they decided to establish a company that would deliver both journals. So we are trying to understand what would be the optimal configuration of this network. So it was a very interesting. So it was a problem. Printing facility of the two newspapers and the you don't have the newspapers already. You, you are printing the newspapers and the trucks are leaving in order for you to start delivery. And where would you start delivering in order for newspapers to get to the doors on time? 7 a.m. is too late. People sometimes need to work before 7 a.m. So if you deliver a newspaper to a door at 7 a.m., it's going to be trash because, you know, sometimes people have left for work. Where would you start delivery? Central areas or outskirts of the city first? Where would you start? Central areas. So they were starting delivering in the outskirts of the city, which would take longer for them to reach. 
because you know uh, you have to drive more miles, take longer. So you start, you know, the first newspaper that are coming from printing, you be delivering to those places. Our optimization algorithm showed that it was not true. We would start the central areas. And you know why? Delivery density. It will start from central areas. A vehicle, a single vehicle, would be able to make more deliveries. It will be saving drivers and vehicle costs. So it's a, another real world application. It was implemented by these companies and they could save nearly 20% of their distribution costs. They were very happy with our solution. Because you know, logistics cost, distribution cost for newspaper is a very high component of the total cost. Okay, so these are some of the other problems that I've been working with, real world problems with my students, com problems that sometimes companies bring to us. And to conclude my presentation, I would like. Okay, okay, I'm just finishing that, that we have a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities to apply operations research. Basically, companies are looking into something that models that can be effectively applied to real world problems. And I have a more realistic models. When I say more realistic models, I mean models that I tailor made to those companies. You, you probably know, are aware that Amazon is hiring scientists. A couple of years ago, Amazon had around 4,000 scientists working for them in the US, developing tools, tailor-made tools for their needs. Companies now see that off-the-shelf products Sometimes they are not ideal for their needs because you have sometimes to adjust the problem to the world. And this is this may not be very efficient. So this is a very huge opportunity for applying analytics and operations research. Uh, even in Brazil, we see big companies have their IT or analytics teams building their own solutions instead of trusting on off-the-shelf marketing solutions. Okay, I think this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Some interesting um, topics. Thank you. Starting. And also we can see, you know, some situations vary from country to country, either adding more complexity or give you more flexibility of solving. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for this for planting lots of work, and I think um, we learn a lot and uh, very good. So, do we have any other questions? You know, for each of the um, studies that Dr. Kuluman presented, we already asked some questions, but this is opportunity for for we to um, ask more. And also for online for online uh, audience, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself, or you can type your question in the chat box. This inspires you to, you know, to learn more about real world problems and address real world problems. I hope this can be some sort of inspiration of you, inspiring. Yeah, actually for my research group, you know, we use a lot of operations research tools, modeling to solve the problem. And then probably Christina mentioned a little bit earlier um, before the seminar that we, we also work in the aviation side, you know, air mobility. And we actually worked on the three echelon delivery, considered the drone plus truck, plus to cycle, plus something else. Okay. Yeah, so we will meet later this afternoon. So I'll be more than happy to, to present what we have done. And also now we're working at advanced air mobility. You know, when you talk about the ambulance, um, we also look into how you know the EV tours can serve the needs, you know, to get to the patients quickly yes. and and also deliver those healthcare products 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Especially in case of Brazil for urban, not urban, rural areas, in which the roads are not very accessible. Right. So it's can just fly. Yes. Right, right, exactly. Okay. And USF is also part of the uh, National Center for Excellence, sponsored by FAA. The name is called the National Center of Excellence for Op Operations Research in Aviation. Wow. So we apply that for air traffic management in order to improve the efficiency, reduce the reduce the delay in the uh, flying time, etc. So we will talk more okay. <laughs> in the afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions from audience online? No. Yes. All right. Anything else? No. Okay. All right, so we have pizza here and feel free. And I want to thank um, Dr. Uh, Kuha again for this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It was a great pleasure for me. It's been a great pleasure. I'll see you next week. Okay, maybe we should have a photo together with uh, Dr. Kuha. Oh.